Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church. Uh, my name is Lindsay Milbrath, one of the elders here at Trinity. Pastor Foot is up top. Uh, Going to assist with the opening hymn. Uh, so, Pastor's message today will be a continuation from the Gospel of St. Matthew. And we will begin with our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, hymn number 803. And if able, please rise on the third verse.
And our service is found in the bulletin on page 2 and also on page 203 in the hymnal. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and, the, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seek his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only begotten son to die for you and for me. And for his sake, he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our psalm today is a portion of Psalm 119. It's printed in your bulletins on pages 2 and 3. We read it responsibly. The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I considered my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. The snares of the wicked have surrounded me, but I have not forgotten your law. I am a companion to all those who fear you and to those who keep your precepts. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you for revealing that Satan is clearly our enemy, 
who disguises himself as an angel of light. Protect us from the natural inclination towards evil, which lurks in the old man, still present within each soul, even the redeemed. We pray that we too would be on the lookout for all causes of sin with the good seed of your grace and the gift of faith, which has the power to change our identity and make us children of the kingdom. Empower us to bear fruit abundantly, even while living side by side with the weeds of the world, sin and evil. Lead us not into temptation. Amen. You may be seated. Old Testament reading for today, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, is from the book of Isaiah, the 44th chapter, beginning at verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. This is the word of the Lord. This morning's second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it and hope that the creation itself will be set free from bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. And we rise for the gospel and the verse for the day. In your bulletin on page 4, you'll see near the top two verses from Matthew 13, verses 37 and 38. We gather our hearts together and read these verses. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one.
The Holy Gospel for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at the 24th verse. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat among them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord. And we remember our baptismal identity and our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 5 in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon hymn is hymn 663, Rise My Soul to Watch and Pray. Main standing for this hymn, we sing verses 1, 2, and 5.
praise to you from our triune God who sows the good seed of his love in Christ, which empowers us to be different in nature and purpose. While we live in a world of weeds that surround us, and yet we have the identity of Christ and his resurrection in our heart, reminding us that we have one foot in heaven and the victory awaits us. You may be seated. So we find ourselves today again in Matthew 13, the greatest chapter of parables in the Bible, at least numerically. And we have heard already the epic parable of the sower, where Jesus once again claims to be the sower and actually the seed that germinates in the hearts of believers to bear fruit. Today we have a similar parable where Jesus also claims to be the sower who has sowed good seeds, and this time the seed becomes the saints. We also learn that the picture is bigger than the first parable of the sower. There's something afoot that's not so good. It is, in fact, an enemy, an evil enemy, who's sowing weeds while everyone else is sleeping. In a world that started out good and simple, it has been intentionally sabotaged and is now much more complicated than it would have been. That's one thing that sin does. It makes life complicated. So as we live in this field of faith, it's really an unholy hybrid of goodness and evil side by side and even in the hearts of the saints. So if you're like me and you read this parable, most people want to know why. Why is it this way? Well, before we get to exploring the why, let's just once again revisit this parable, which Jesus gives probably the most succinct point-by-point -point explanation of any parable in Scripture. The sower is Jesus, the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And by the way, notice how they become offspring of the evil one who sowed them. The enemy is the devil, the reapers are the angels, the harvest is the close of the age, which brings, of course, two different results. The weeds are destroyed in a perpetual fire, we learn that from companion verses, and the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So when I read this parable, and especially this time when I read the parable in preparation for today's message, I got stuck on the word enemy. So I thought about a number of spiritual and philosophical questions related to that idea that God has an enemy. First question, why would God have an enemy? God, the source of all goodness and grace. And why would this enemy desire to destroy a perfectly good field with useless weeds? Perplexing. And what enemy of God would ever hope to win a battle against the almighty, omnipotent God himself who would pick a fight with God. And if God is all-knowing, and this is maybe the most puzzling question, why would he allow this enemy to exist and gain a foothold by doing this evil action? And of course, we could go on and on with questions about the mysteries of the kingdom. So the quick and really penultimate answer, we will get the ultimate answer at the return of Christ, but the penultimate answer is, we don't know. We don't know, but we do know that God has told us that he is not really the origin of evil. He didn't tell us precisely why Satan rebelled against him, but we know that from this simple parable that Satan is an enemy of Christ, and he is an enemy of the word of God, which is also who Christ is. And those two come together in the parable. So Lutheran scholar Edward Kaler, who wrote the uh, book, A Summary of Christian Doctrine, had this quote about these questions. doesn't answer all of them exhaustively, but it's a start. God is not a creator, author, or cause of sin. 
But by the instigation of the devil, through one man, sin has entered the world. The devil is the external cause of sin. Created good and holy, the devil is not tempted and seduced by anyone else. But the first thought of sin and rebellion against God originated with him. And then he quotes an important verse, 1 John 3, 8, the devil has sinned from the beginning. And I just read a concluding comment from this same context from Kaler. How, was it, how it was possible for a perfectly good and holy angel to conceive the father of sin, we do not know. And it is futile to try to trace the origin and cause of sin beyond the devil. He is to this day the driving force in the children of unbelief. I think this is helpful, but not really quite satisfying for inquisiting minds. Jesus' disciple John gives us a little bit more information in the first chapter of his first epistle. This is verse 5. And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So God has no sin in him. But there are qualifying verses that make the whole picture a little bit more mysterious. And you probably remember this one, Genesis 3, 22, after the fall. God, and really most commentators, see it as the triune God communicating in the corporate trinity. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So God knows what evil is, but he has no evil dwelling within him. It's a conundrum. But it is the advantage of being God. When we know evil, evil becomes us. So we recall Satan's original temptation to Eve in Genesis 3. You surely will not die. And I'll pause there to make a comment that the culture asserts things very strongly and can be very persuasive, just like Satan. That's a bold face assertion. And of course, it's a complete lie. You surely will not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I think possibly we may have some clue into why Satan actually rebelled. He is not all-knowing. We know that. He may not have known the cost of his coveting for himself this knowledge which God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had, the knowledge of good and evil. But he certainly did know the cost for Adam and Eve, and he just lied about it. The cost was death and alienation from God. So although we cannot ultimately answer this question, how did the enemy of God become evil, we certainly should know a little bit more about the enemy and what the nature of evil is. So shortly after Jesus gave us these beautiful redemptive and I would add reformation verses in John chapter 8, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And you hear that freedom message in our epistle reading today. Jesus frees us from death, condemnation, and the captivity of Satan's wiles. Two verses later, Jesus would say, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. There's that slavery and freedom idea. And then Jesus would later, a few verses later in John chapter 8, describe enemy and evil this way. This is one verse, by the way, a long verse. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And when Jesus says that he's a murderer, I don't think he's really describing the first murder of Abel with Cain, but actually the murder that he achieved by maligning and deceiving Adam and Eve, it was death by deception. Just uh, this past week at the Summer Christian Fellowship at Cornell, 
I mentioned that even Christians can be idol makers. Idol makers in part because we have this little heartfelt idol within us that imagines what truth should be. And whenever God's word kind of abuts against that, we tend to have some angst and then we often either ignore that word because it doesn't align with what we privately believe or we chip away at it and we somehow say, well, that can't really be true because of these reasons and we have formed our own idol and lifestyle, death by deception. So the word evil is very illuminating when we take a look at its original meaning. This is what uh, the lexicon says about the word that Jesus used to describe sons of the evil one. Pain, laborious trouble, properly pain-ridden, emphasizing the inevitable agonies or misery that always goes along with evil. How is that tempting? Well, it's not. But Satan never exposes his full hand. He doesn't tell us what's really going to go on. He wants to mask the misery that's behind the evil. Another word that Jesus uses in this text today is the word devil. We, we know it. It's carried over in English and in uh, Latin, diablos. So, the word literally in the original language means to throw through. And this is how we get the idea as Satan, Diablos, as our accuser. He knows what we've done wrong. He knows the ethics and morality of the commandments. They were, after all, written in stone. He can read them too, and he knows parts of the Bible. He throws accusations at us because of our shortcomings, because we have not loved, lived up to God's grace and calling. And that's what we find in the field. We find all sorts of infighting back and forth between both saints and sinners, the sons of the evil one and the sons of our Father in heaven, and sometimes within ourselves. This is a world that distorts truth. It finds security in slander and self-righteousness. It elevates its own word above God's word and that's just the way it is in the world. This is this chaotic field that we live in. What brings us clarity? The clear word of Christ. So the uh, title of today's sermon <clears throat> is kind of stuck in the head of a kid who grew up in the 60s and 70s. And really a phrase, sympathy for the devil, comes straight out of the rock and roll era from none other than that very, not really godly band, the Rolling Stones. The title sounds like an endorsement of evil, sympathy for the devil. But when you actually read what some of the Rolling Stones said about that song, they describe they were very well aware that living in the world was a world that manifested itself as evil, and they were caught up in it. In fact, three of the Rolling Stones at the time that that song was written were already uh, found guilty for breaking uh, drug offenses, and Keith Richards was going to face one year in jail. And of course, cries of the fans were, no, no, don't do that, so they had one night in jail instead. But this is what Keith Richards says about the song, Sympathy for the Devil. It was a time of turmoil. It was the first sort of international chaos since World War II, and confusion is not the ally of peace and love. You want to think that the world is perfect, but you can't hide. You might as well accept the fact that evil is there and deal with it any way you can. Sympathy for the Devil is a song that says, don't forget him. If you confront him, then he's out of a job. <laughs> a little bit of a mixed message there. What God really says is do what with the devil? Flee from him. He is way bigger than you and me, and he's been at this much longer. As long as Satan, who is our accuser and enemy, is around, we will lose. What we need is an advocate, literally one who speaks for us, whose voice of mercy 
and grace drowns out the accusatory true statements of Satan. This person is a sinner. Jesus said, you will be able to distinguish the wheat and the tares in another parable from their fruits. That is a true statement. As people mature in the faith, it's pretty clear whether or not they are of their father in heaven or whether they are of the father, the evil one. When Jesus tells us this parable of the wheat and the tares, that's oftentimes the way it's pronounced as opposed to the weeds, um, most commentators believe that Jesus is talking about a specific weed called darnel, which grows up and side by side early on is almost indistinguishable from wheat. They look identical until they reach maturity. One of the implications of this is that as mature Christians, we're supposed to bear fruit. That's one of the ways that the world can see the difference between us, children of the Heavenly Father, and the evil one. But one of the dangers of looking at fruit alone is that we can become exactly what Satan wants us to be, self-righteous people who say, look at my fruit. Jesus, already using the word abide today, and then again in John 15, which includes my confirmation verse, John 15, 5, says this about abiding in him. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And then the next verse is very helpful. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So abiding in Jesus the vine is far more the key than just looking at your own fruit. One of the signs of your abiding is that you're here today. You have a direct connection to him through his word, and when we celebrate the sacrament, through his sacrament. As we think about the end of this parable, the reaping and the harvest, I want to bring one final word about heaven and hell. I think as we read these words at the end of the parable, talking about being burned and cast into the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, I think that might be described as understatedly awful. It is awful but I don't think it's quite fully the way God describes it elsewhere. You probably know that many more people believe in heaven than hell. I mean, that, that tells you that they'd much rather go there, right? I mean, the statistics bear that out. Jesus, of course, believed in them both. He dwelt in heaven before there was any creation, and then hell was created by God as a place of eternal judgment for Satan, chiefly, for all of his angels and those who are his children, people who have rejected Christ, the merciful Savior of the world. I just want to look at one phrase in there, actually one word, the word weeping. It doesn't seem like much, right? This is what my dictionary says about that word that Jesus used in this parable. The word originally means to grieve audibly. It also was used as bitter grief that springs from feeling utterly hopeless. Jesus is about saving us from hopelessness. That's why he's called our living hope. I mean, can you imagine being in a place where you're utterly hopeless all the time? An eternity of hopelessness is not what God wants for us. Instead, he wants the opposite. Shining like the sons of God. Martin Luther said this as he was looking at Revelation 20. He was commenting about the lake of fire versus what is destined for Christians. 
Luther said, I believe that Christ will return from heaven on the last day and judge those who are alive at the end of time and those who have died before that day, that all mankind, angels and devils, will have to appear before his judgment seat and throne, and throne to see him visually. Then he will redeem me and all those who believe in him from bodily death and every infirmity and will eternally punish his enemies and adversaries and deliver us from their power forever. Jesus really has already delivered us. Jesus in John 5 says, if you believe in him, you are already passed from death into life. Our judgment day comes at the point he gives us the gift of grace and faith, comes in the waters of baptism, celebrated at the communion room. We have the victory now. We're not waiting for it. We are living in confidence as people who are redeemed. We abide in the vine. We are not afraid of judgment day. Our judgment day took place on Good Friday where Christ was found guilty and you and I were found innocent. I leave you with a verse that's very dear to my heart. It's my daughter Jennifer's confirmation verses from the very end of the book of Jude, before the last book in the Bible. Jude, we believe, is the half-brother of Jesus. And this is what he believed about his half-brother, his Lord and God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy, to him, the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We rise and we sing the offertory hymn. The offertory hymn is God's own child, I gladly say it. Hymn 594, verses 1, 2, and 3. This time we receive your offerings and prayers. There's an orange card in front of you. If you have a prayer request for the worship, fill it out, give it to the children. 
If it's a private prayer request, fill out the back and drop it in the box as you leave today. You may be seated. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your parables. They come alongside us, they draw us into you, your word, and your kingdom. And they are something that's so simple and yet so deep. It feeds our soul every time we revisit them. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that we would remember the gospel. You came as our substitute, something we could not do on our own. You redeemed us, and you give us that gift freely through the gift of faith, through the waters of baptism, and once again restored and renewed at the table. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us, that we would shine forth now as people who are children of the Heavenly Father. We pray that we would not doubt the grace and mercy you give us, which is able to defend us against Satan. May we never slumber or sleep, but always be vigilant, watching for all causes of sin, and running to Christ, our Savior, for defense and for forgiveness. In your name we pray, amen. Number of prayers today, uh, Lauren Champion, um, for her prayers for strength during her great uncle's uh, death, apparently uh, recent, uh, that he would live on uh, in the memory of the children and that they could cope with the death and be with his wife, uh, that she may trust in Christ and, um, and not be afraid walking with him. We also pray a prayer um, from... The Wheatons, a prayer of praise to God that Ray Wheaton is out of the hospital and here at Trinity today. Didn't know that. Good to see you, Ray. And may God continue to heal and bless Ray and grant strength to him and wisdom to Vivian. Um, there's a prayer request uh, for Pastor Cooper. Pastor Cooper is having a pretty significant sinus surgery tomorrow, so we pray God's blessing upon him. Um, also, uh, Stephanie Halverson, uh, thankful for a good turnout this past week at the Summer Christian Fellowship that Trinity hosted this week. Thanks for all the help in that regard. A prayer for family reconciliation and um, a prayer for Daniel, um, who is feeling anxious about his health. 
And may the Lord bless uh, our synodical convention, which is going on this next week and the week thereafter. Please rise for these prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the gift of life. And in this gift, we also have a second gift you make available to us, faith. Faith which gives us far more than what we imagine. Forgiveness of sins and eternal life and fellowship live with you now and forever. We pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, the family of Lauren's great uncle uh, as they think about those promises uh, help those who grieve. May they remember him as the gift he was to the family. And may you uh, bless the family with the assurance that his faith uh, allowed him to be in your presence in heaven. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who are uh, going through medical distress. Uh, we pray for Pastor Cooper, who will be having sinus surgery tomorrow. Guide those who care for him and help bring him healing and strength and restore him uh, quickly and mercifully. Uh, and may this present burden uh, strengthen his faith and draw both the church and his family closer to you. We pray, Lord, for Daniel, who's been feeling anxious about his health. Uh, we pray that um, he would not be afraid but cast his burden upon you <clears throat> and rest in you, knowing that he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless uh, Ray Wheaton as he recovers from his stroke. We're so thankful he is not only out of the hospital, but able to worship once again. Continue to bless his healing and be with Vivian and grant them both discernment and guidance in the weeks and months ahead. We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word and the good news of Jesus as our Redeemer with students and many others who came to the uh, Cornell Summer Christian Fellowship this week. We pray that the word that was sown would bear good fruit and that people, even people who were not in faith, would come to faith by that merciful word. We pray, Lord, that the power of your love and peacemaking and forgiveness would bring family reconciliation uh, to our petitioner and all those who experience distress in families. May there be peace surrounded by Christ, who is our Savior. We also pray, Lord, that you would be with your church, Trinity Lutheran Church, and the entire Lutheran Church Missouri Synod as we try to carry that cross boldly in a time when there is great confusion, a great distortion of truth, um, and even within the church, uh, dissension and separation. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the convention, that they would be guided by your word. Uh, we pray that any difficult decisions uh, would be clear, uh, made clear by the body of Christ and by your word to us. So we ask your blessing upon this church that gathers in convention at the end of this week and next week. In the name of Christ, we pray, and we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I um, just have a heads up. We have um, two things going on simultaneously that are somewhat difficult to have simultaneous, and that is that we are uh, going through uh, much of our preschool stuff and editing it out, and we, we knew we were anticipating this, and so all of that's out there, but on Saturday we have a blood drive, a Red Cross blood drive that takes place in the same place. So... Uh, just pay attention to your emails. We are working on details on how to uh, get that space cleared out and prepared for the blood drive on Saturday. And then um, there's a, 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 they call a shower, that's what they call it, on Sunday in the same place, I believe. So uh, that's the plan. So please pay attention to um, your email this week and look for information how you could come sometime this week uh, to help with that process. Uh, other announcements? Stephanie? Our next group is meeting today after church. We're going to Lodi Park. We're going to uh, carpool from here. Um, if you have any other questions, please see me or Kate. 
Thank you. And by the way, related to that, you may have heard that um, the voters meeting that we had set up for this afternoon or for after church today is postponed for a variety of reasons. We've got a lot of things that uh, just said, let's wait until we get a bit more things uh, as far as information and clarity. Um, and then uh, don't forget, Wednesday we have a Bible class um, on uh, Wednesday at 6, Confession and Absolution. And I see Carla waiting for the bell. Um, the good thing about the voters meeting being uh, postponed is that we, that we can have bell choir. So if you're in Belmont and we're going to have a quick rehearsal on when, after I finish my invitation. And finally, uh, related to the uh, purging of items, there are several tables out here that are clearly labeled for anyone to take items, and there's uh, a lot of nice books and toys and variety of things, so have at it. Today's a great time to do that. Go in there and take whatever you would like or you would like to re-gift to others. Um, that would be a blessing. Okay, no more announcements? Very good. Let us go with God's blessing. Let us bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. 924 is our closing hymn.